The skeleton of the upper limb is divided into four segments. The shoulder, made up of the scapula and clavicle. The arm, made up of the humerus. The forearm, which includes the radius and ulna. And the hand, made up of the carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. The clavicle is commonly called the collarbone. It runs from the sternum out to the acromion process of the scapula, and the two ends are named to correspond. The end connected to the sternum is, of course, the sternal end, and the end connected out at the shoulder is the acromial end. A more detailed view of the clavicle shows some important features, including this one shown here, the conoid tubercle. The conoid tubercle is located near the acromial end and comes off the posterior edge of the clavicle. Knowing this, you can determine if you're dealing with the left or the right clavicle. Just opposite from the conoid tubercle, along the anterior edge here, is the attachment site for the deltoid, the deltoid tubercle. And running along the inferior surface is a prominent groove called the subclavian groove. This is the site of attachment for the small muscle called the subclavius. The second bone that makes up the shoulder is the scapula. It's a flat, triangular bone on the posterior lateral aspect of the thorax. Along the posterior surface of the scapula is a prominent ridge called the scapular spine. And at the lateral end of the spine is the acromion process, which, as I mentioned before, articulates with the clavicle. Just anterior to the acromion process is another process called the coracoid process that helps to stabilize the shoulder joint. Above the scapular spine is an indentation called the supraspinous fossa. Below it is another called the infraspinous fossa, and here on the anterior surface of the scapula is the subscapular fossa. All of these are attachment sites for muscles of the rotator cuff. The borders of the scapula are named for clarity to help with orientation. The edge closest to the vertebral column is the medial border, this diagonal edge is the lateral border, and the top is the superior border. Along the superior border, near the coracoid process, is the suprascapular notch through which the suprascapular nerve travels. The angles of the scapula are also defined. They're named the superior and inferior angles. And this smooth depression here on the lateral edge is the glenoid fossa. This is the point of articulation between the scapula and the head of the humerus. The humerus is the bone that makes up the designated arm section of the upper limb. We have two views of the humerus here, the posterior view and the anterior view. The head of the humerus is the portion that articulates with the scapula in the glenoid fossa that was just shown. And at the base of the head is what's referred to as the anatomical neck. Just distal to the anatomical neck, you'll find two prominent bumps, one that's larger than the other. The larger one is called the greater tubercle and is located more on the lateral surface of the humerus, as opposed to the smaller one that's called the lesser tubercle, which is located on the anterior surface. And between these two tubercles is the inner tubercular groove. Just distal to the tubercles is the surgical neck of the humerus which is a common site for fractures. As you move down the shaft of the humerus, about midway on the lateral surface, you'll find another roughened prominence, which is called the deltoid tuberosity. This is the insertion point of the deltoid on the humerus. And running next to the deltoid tuberosity on its posterior side is the shallow radial groove. This groove is the path for the radial nerve and deep artery of the arm. The distal end of the humerus flares out medially and laterally, forming slight ridges on both sides. These ridges are known as supracondylar ridges. That name is fitting since the ridges are located just above the medial and lateral epicondyle shown here. And the epicondyles lie just above the condyle of the humerus. Now, a condyle is a prominence that usually serves as a point of articulation, and in this case, the condyle of the humerus helps form the elbow joint.
On the posterior surface, there's a large, obvious depression called the olecranon fossa. This allows for the full extension of the elbow. On the anterior surface, there are two smaller depressions. Laterally is the radial fossa, which accommodates the head of the radius during flexion, and medially is the coronoid fossa that receives a process of the ulna during flexion. There are two articular surfaces of the condyle. The laterally located capitulum, which articulates with the head of the radius, and the more medial pulley-shaped trochlea that articulates with the ulna. There are two bones that make up the forearm of the upper limb, the radius and ulna. The radius is found in the lateral portion of the forearm, or the side closest to the thumb. A good way to remember that is to think that when you say something is rad, you give it a thumbs up. So rad helps you remember radius, and the thumbs up helps you remember that the radius is on the side of your thumb. Now you might have a better not so dorky way to remember that, but it helped me. The radius is also the shorter of the two bones. The structures on the radius are fairly simple though. At the proximal end, you have the head, which articulates with the humerus at the capitulum. Just below the head is the neck, and just below the neck, on the medial surface, you'll find a small bump called the radial tuberosity. At the distal end, on the medial surface, there's a slight depression forming the ulnar notch. This notch articulates with the head of the ulna, and laterally, is a conical projection, shown here, called the styloid process. The ulna is much larger than the radius. It's easily distinguishable by the large olecranon and coronoid processes on its proximal end, which form the large trochlear notch, shown here. On its anterior surface, just distal to the coronoid process, is a small protrusion called the tuberosity of the ulna, which is the insertion point for the brachialis muscle. On the lateral side of the coronoid process is a smooth depression called the radial notch that receives a part of the head of the radius. It rubs against the head of the radius. Just inferior to this notch is a prominent ridge called the supinator crest. And just anterior to the crest is another smooth depression called the supinator fossa. At the distal end, we only have two structures that we want to point out. The head of the ulna here, and again another conical styloid process off its medial edge, as opposed to the styloid process of the radius that comes off its lateral edge. Distal to the forearm is the wrist and hand. The wrist is made up of eight small individual bones called carpals. All of these little bones is what allows for the fluid mobility and the wide range of motion in the wrist. A simple mnemonic to help us remember all of those little bones is some lawyers take profits that they can't have. Now there are other mnemonics that some are more memorable than that, but if you want to find those out, you'll have to look them up for yourself. This mnemonic helps us remember the names of the bones as well as their orientation to each other. The names of the bones are the scaphoid, lunate, trichotrum, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. Now the only way that the mnemonic works to remember their orientation to each other is if you remember the bones in a certain directional order. Now here we're looking at an anterior view of the right wrist and hand. So it's as if we were looking at your palm. Going in a lateral to medial direction, in the proximal row of carpals, we have the scaphoid, lunate, trichotrum, and pisiform. These all articulate with the radius and ulna. The rest of the carpals articulate with the bones of the palm. And moving again in a lateral to medial direction, we have the trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. Now, in order for the mnemonic to help with their orientation, you have to remember the bones in that order. 
The trapezium is found at the base of the thumb, or on the lateral side. And then you have the trapezoid at the base of the index finger, the capitate at the base of the middle finger, and the hamate at the base of the ring and pinky finger. Now the bones that form the palm of the hand and articulate with these carpals are called the metacarpals. These don't have any special names, but instead are just numbered. Starting with the metacarpal that attaches to the thumb as the first metacarpal, they're numbered one through five, the fifth being the metacarpal that attaches to the little finger. All the remaining bones distal to the metacarpals are considered phalanges and make up the bones of the fingers. But since there are multiple phalanges in each finger, we have to further define them as proximal, middle, and distal. Each finger has a proximal phalanx, only the second, third, fourth, and fifth digits have a middle phalanx, and again, all of them have a distal phalanx.